Hi, this is Sam and welcome to Inglogic, following on from my video on sentence stress, which you can find over here. Today we're going to have a thorough look at English intonation and its various patterns. As I mentioned in that video, intonation is the one topic that I'm very wary of teaching because although we do have rules, they tend to be subject to personal interpretation and individual personality and different accents and not just the big categories, for example, British, American, South African, Australian, but also within these same categories. For example, under the big umbrella term British English, you have several accents such as Cockney, George, Scouse, all of which you can find over here. And even they each have their own idiosyncrasies when it comes to intonation. With that in mind, we'll analyse the most standard rules of standard British English, and I myself don't agree with some of them, and I'll tell you why. If you've looked into intonation before, you might be familiar with the terms falling intonation, rising intonation, fall rise, which are the terms that indicate the direction of your intonation and pitch, which is exactly what we're going to explore today. And what is important to know is that these patterns mainly apply to content words, primarily the last one in the sentence, as these are the words that we stress. For more information on content and function words, do have a look at my video on sentence stress, and here you can also see what happens to them in terms of pronunciation. But as a quick recap, content words are the words that carry stress and they carry meaning, and they're what your brain needs to know in order to understand what's happening. These words are main verbs, adjectives, nouns and adverbs. Question words are not usually considered content words but from now on I'll start including them. Now we're going to look at statements. When you give a straight fact, a straight piece of information, we use a falling intonation. So we go down primarily on the last content word. If we look at the sentence I don't like coffee, we go down with intonation, primarily on the last content word, which is coffee. So we say, I don't like coffee, I don't like coffee, I don't like coffee, rather than going up and, for example, saying, I don't like coffee, I don't like coffee, we say, I don't like coffee, coffee, coffee. In the sentence, she called me. The last and only content word is called, so the falling intonation mainly applies to that, and we say, she called me, she called me, she called me, she called me. They love chocolate, they love chocolate, they love chocolate, rather than they love chocolate, they love chocolate, they love chocolate. The baby is crying, the baby is crying, the baby is crying, rather than the baby is crying, the baby is crying. Now listen to these two replies to the question, what do you think of the film? And tell me what kind of situation and emotion they convey. The first answer is, I think it's good. I think it's good. I think it's good. This is a falling intonation. I think it's good. I think it's good. And this is a straight fact. So I genuinely think it's good and that's the end of it. It's a, it's a true fact. There is nothing more to be said. And what do you understand from the second answer, which is, I think it's good. I think it's good. This can mean two things. First of all, it can mean that you want to add more and you're just trying to find the right words to say in your head. So you can say, I think it's good but they could have done much more with it. So by saying, I think it's good and leaving me on the rise, I understand that I have to wait for you to finish your sentence because there is more to come. Or if you just leave it like that and say, I think it's good, I also understand that you're not sure. So by saying that, you're basically telling me that you're not convinced that it was a good film. This intonation pattern I think it's good, is called fall rise. I think it's good, and it conveys uncertainty, doubt, and more to be said. If I say, she's a good performer, but I've seen much better. Here I'm using this fall rise intonation to give 
criticism because here I am saying that I'm not entirely sure she is the best performer. In fact, I know that for a fact because I have seen much better. So that's a way to introduce a small uh, critique. Now let's talk about questions and we'll start from open questions, so WH questions which can't be answered with a simple yes or no. In a standard way, we use a falling intonation, just like in a statement. So we would say, where did you go? What did she say? What time did they get back? Now, these are standard emotionless questions, but we can add emotion and personality when we ask these questions, and this is where things get tricky. Let's imagine two friends are chewing the fat and updating each other on what's been going on in their lives. One can say, I went on a date with Tom. Now, the friend can ask a very factual, emotionless and standard question by going down and saying, where did he take you? Where did he take you? But friends usually add a bit more emotion to what they're saying. And you can do that by adding a bit of cheeky personality by saying, for example, oh, where did he take you? Oh, where did he take you? So you go up, where did he take you? Or, oh, where did he take you? Oh, where did he take you? These are not the brutally standard patterns, but they're the ones that we use the most, especially in a friendly situation, because we want to add our own personal twist and spin to what we're saying. Another reaction to, I went on a date with Tom, can be a very factual, what did you do? What did you do? What did you do? But you can also say, what did you do? What did you do? Or, what did you do? what did you do? Where we go up on a lot of different words to add a bit more emphasis and personal involvement. If you say, I went on a date, I can ask a genuine question by asking, who did you go on a date with? Who did you go on a date with? You can add a bit more personality by saying, who did you go on a date with? Something like that. But if you say, I went on a date with Tom. Now listen to how I reply. I say, who did you go on a date with? Who did you go on a date with? So by going so high on all these words, especially ending on who did you go on a date with? This is not a genuine question. I already know who you went on a date with because you've told me that it was with Tom. But by stressing who did you go on a date with, so primarily who and with, I am showing shock and surprise. So I basically want you to repeat what you've said because I'm so shocked and surprised that I I don't believe it. So I want full confirmation of what you've just said. With this in mind, we can say, he took me to a Michelin starred restaurant. Where did he take you? Where did he take you? I know where he took you, but I'm so shocked and surprised that this is the way you react to it by basically asking for confirmation because you can't believe it. Now it's time to talk about the part that I disagree with. Most books and teachers tell us that in a closed question, so a question that can only be answered with yes or no, the intonation is arising. So we go up at the end. So in this question, they say we should go are you English? Are you English? Are you English? Are you English? Let's imagine I'm abroad and I meet a guy and I ask him a genuine question. Now, I personally would go down with intonation and I actually think that's the most common option. I would say, are you English? Are you English? Are you English? Now, you can go up and we do do it, but to me that already means that it's not a factual, standard, emotionless question. And I've watched a lot of interviews with actors and between actors, and the way they ask each other questions confirms my theory, because they don't really go up, they go down when they ask each other closed questions. Let's say I'm abroad, I meet this guy, and since I'm abroad, I don't expect everyone to be English. But now we've been talking for a while, and based on his accent, I assume that he is English. So if I ask him, are you English, and I go, up, that can mean two things to me. First of all, it can mean that I basically already know that he is, but I just want to double check. So I'm asking for confirmation of something that I already know. 
Or it can also mean that I am positively surprised. So I'm showing my positive and personal involvement. So finally, I found another English guy abroad. So the way I would ask is actually two. So I would say, are you English? Are you English? Are you English? Which is the option that books and teachers often give. But I would also say, are you English? Are you English? Are you English? Are you English? So I would go up, but also slightly further down towards the end. So I wouldn't just go, are you English? Are you English? I would say, are you English? Where I would also put a bit of up and down intonation on R. Are you English? Are you English? This riseful, riseful intonation personally also conveys the idea of a genuine question. So I don't know if you are English and I'm genuinely asking, but it conveys it in a more personal and positively involved way. So I, I'm hoping that you are English because it's nice to meet English people abroad just so I can feel at home. So I am really interested in finding out if you are English. So are you English? Are you English? Another meaning of this riseful, riseful intonation could be that from your accent, I can tell that you might be English, but I can't quite place it because you don't have a specific, typical accent of a specific area. But your English is too good for you to be a foreigner. So I am genuinely curious and also a bit confused because I can't really understand what's happening. So by asking, are you English? I'm genuinely conveying confusion and extra interest. If I want to ask this question in a very factual, detached way, almost scientifically, so I scientifically want to know if your surgery was painful, I would go down. I would say, was it painful? Was it painful? Was it painful? However, I do go up myself because first of all, I am quite flamboyant when I speak and also I do want to add um, personal involvement and interest in what I say. So if my friend tells me that they had to undergo surgery, I would say, was it painful? By saying this, was it painful? I'm showing interest empathy and sympathy as well and I'm basically hoping for my friend to say that it wasn't painful because I'm putting myself in their shoes and obviously I wouldn't want to feel pain. In this question I would either go down, do you like tea, do you like tea, do you like tea, or slightly up, do you like tea, do you like tea, do you like tea? And this is actually the option that I think I use the most because I do like adding personality to what I say. But what other teachers on YouTube seem to suggest is that we should go really high with intonation and say, do you like tea? Do you like tea? Do you like tea? Now, again, this is my personal objection to this rule. Now, if you ask me, do you like tea? I personally perceive it as you being frustrated. So let's imagine that I've told you I don't drink coffee, I don't drink alcohol, I don't drink Coke, I don't drink orange juice. So you don't really know what to offer me anymore. So you go, do you like tea? Do you like tea? Specifically with this question, because it includes would you like, which implies a genuine offer, I don't think I would go flat and say, would you like a cup of tea? Would you like a cup of tea? Which is possible, but very, very detached. Here, I would go slightly higher and say, would you like a cup of tea? Would you like a cup of tea? Would you like a cup of tea? And this to me sounds like a genuine offer, but I wouldn't really go as high as other teachers seem to suggest, which is, would you like a cup of tea? Would you like a cup of tea? Would you like a cup of tea? Again, I don't find it to be natural, or if it is natural, I do detect a bit of frustration, but that could be just me. Let me know in the comments what you think about this and how you say these sentences and how you perceive them based on the intonation pattern that someone uses. However, just to make things a little bit more complicated, there are a couple of cases where even I think that just going down may sound a bit detached and potentially rude. For example, if you say, does anybody have a pen? Does anybody have a pen? Does anybody have a pen? 
Can I ask you a question? Can I ask you a question? Can I ask you a question? Now, asking these questions like that really does sound detached, rude and uh, snooty maybe even, because if you ask, does anybody have a pen? Basically, you're asking people to give you a pen. So you do want to be slightly nicer about it. So I would personally go slightly higher in intonation, but not very much. I would say, does anybody have a pen? Does anybody have a pen rather than pen? Pen rather than pen. Can I ask you a question? Can I ask you a question? Can I ask you a question? But not, can I ask you a question? Can I ask you a question? Can I ask you a question? Because that to me sounds frustrated. Maybe we are in a meeting and someone just keeps talking, 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 talking without letting anyone speak. So after a while, I'm frustratingly checking if I can ask a question. So, can I ask a question? Can I ask you a question? Can I ask you a question? Back to WH questions. Earlier we said that when we ask a genuine question, we go down. Where do you live? What's your name? But we can go up just to double check. Maybe we've forgotten what someone has told us earlier, so we just want to ask the same question again, just to be sure. So, we can go, where do you live? Where do you live? Where do you live? What's your name? What's your name? What's your name? It can also convey frustration if we say, why didn't he call me? Why didn't he call me? Why didn't he call me? Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Let's look at what happens to when he came back. If I use it on its own as a reply, we go down. So, when did he give you the present? When he came back. When he came back when he came back, because it's on its own. He gave me the present when he came back. He gave me the present when he came back. He gave me the present when he came back. Again, this goes down because it's at the end of a sentence. But when he came back, he gave me the present. When he came back, he gave me the present. When he came back, he gave me the present. That means that when a secondary clause comes before the main clause, we have to go slightly up with intonation so that our brain understands that there is more to come. We can't say, when he came back, he gave me the present. When he came back, so our brain understands it still needs to listen, he gave me the present. When he came back, he gave me the present. That's it for today. If you like this video, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up and to subscribe to my channel down below. And do let me know in the comments if you have any questions about this terrible topic that is intonation, how you use it and how you perceive it based on the intonation patterns that people use. In the meantime, I will see you on Tuesday with another explanation video.